Hello everyone and welcome to today's DDN webinar. I'm Catherine Loidel, Associate Science Editor for DDN and I'll be moderating our discussion. Before we begin, I would like to introduce our sponsor for today's webinar. PHC Corporation of North America is a subsidiary of PHC Holdings Corporation Tokyo Japan, a global leader in development, design and manufacturing of laboratory equipment for the biopharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical life sciences, academic, healthcare and government markets. Biomedical product lines are marketed under the PHCBI brand. These products include the space-saving and energy-efficient VIP Eco, Twin Guard and the VIP Series ultra-low temperature freezers, cryogenic and biomedical freezers, pharmacy and high-performance refrigerators, cell culture CO2 and multi-gas incubators, and drosophila and plant growth chambers. Our sponsor has provided us with some handouts related to today's webinar, which can be found under the handouts tab. We have an exciting webinar planned for you today. Our speaker, Dr. Beth Simony, will be discussing advances in imaging and high content screening. After the talk, Dr. Simony will participate in a live Q&A. To submit your questions or comments, simply submit to the Q&A portal to the right of your screen. We will try to get to as many as possible. And with that, let me introduce today's speaker. Beth is the lead image assay developer for the imaging platform at the Broad Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. After doing research in visual neuroscience with William Eldred at Boston University as an undergraduate, she obtained a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology with Elizabeth Blackburn at UCSF, studying the difference between splicing variants of the telomere master scaffolding protein, TIN2. These projects honed her interest in image analysis, leading her to join Anne Carpenter's lab at the Broad, where she leads a team collaborating with approximately 30 outside scientists per year on their own custom image an analysis projects. She also co-maintains the lab's main software tool, Cell Profiler, and directs the broad efforts towards community engagement and driving biological projects for the Center for Open Bioimage Analysis, or COBA. Um, Beth, I'll just check your slides are up and running. Okay, great, um, take it away, Beth, thank you. Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. I would love to thank the organizers for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk to you today about some of the work we've done at the Imaging Platform, which is also known as Ann Carpenter's Lab at the Bird Institute, uh, trying to unlock the full potential of microscopy images um, using high content analysis software like Cell Profiler and also the general approach of morphological profiling. We're passionate about working with images in the imaging platform because they contain so much information, although that isn't historically how they've been viewed. Uh, it's well known that images can be used for complex model systems, that you can get single cell resolution, and that you can multiplex quite a number of stains in an image. Um, but the idea that these are quantitative sources of data really didn't catch on until somewhat recently. And a large part of that is simply because they were being analyzed not by computer software in the past, but with human brains. And human brains are notoriously bad at quantification. Uh, when I first showed this image, or when you look at it quickly, you might think that this is a color image. In fact, it isn't. As we go in further, you see that this is in fact a grayscale image that has had some colored lines drawn over it. And your brain fills in the rest and makes you think that the rest of it is color. Your brain is designed to give you the, the big picture of a situation quickly. It's a great survival tool, but it's terrible for quantification or for doing quantitative analysis. So images were not thought of as a quantification source. Thankfully, with the rise of computer-aided image analysis software, that is changing. Um, and the way a lot of this analysis has been done to date is by the measurement and scoring of known phenotypes. Um, there are a lot of great stories that I don't have time to tell you about any of today, but um, doing work in that mode can have tremendous translational impact. If you know the phenotype that you want to see, you can devise something that helps you actually uh, deter a disease or make a treatment better. Um, and in general, this is the way most biology happens. Um, this paper is a few years old now, but previous work from our group showed that even for papers that were reporting on a high content screen, and with high content, you would think perhaps they're looking at lots of different aspects of their images. In fact, most papers that called themselves high content, uh, in terms of the cellular features in their image analysis, were only using one to two. And again, much 
great biology is done that way. But that leaves the millions of pixels that you're ca are captured every time you snap a microscope camera, and then the millions more pixels every additional channel you acquire or every additional z-plane left behind. And our, our lab's work has been to say, what can we do with all of those millions of pixels to make them a rich, mineable data source? How can we go further so that we're not just looking for one or two things we know we care about, but taking advantage of all of those millions of pixels to find things we didn't even know we should care about? And so that's where this idea of morphological profiling started to really come to life, um, not just going for what we knew we wanted, but for looking for our unknown unknowns. And ultimately, the principle that underlies this is the one I just told you about, which is the fact that our brains are not really designed to quantitatively identify images, but there are computer tools who can do it far better than we can. Um, these are some label-free uh, cell cycle images. Um, when I give this talk in person, I usually ask if anyone in the audience wants to raise their hand and tell me which cell cycle phase each image is in, and I've never actually had a hand go up for that. Um, you might have guessed that these were in some particular order, but I certainly, without knowing that these are in a particular order, couldn't tell you what cell cycle phase just from these little gray circles. But a computer can do so based on things like texture features extremely reliably. And even the mistakes that it makes kind of make sense. For S phase, it sometimes gets a little bit confused as to whether it's it might be actually G1 or G2. For prophase, it sometimes thinks it still might be G2. And those make sense because in fact, what these phases are, are, are a continuous biological process and not actually discrete events. So that even when it makes errors, the errors are usually things that are understandable from a biological point of view. And here's just a pretty spinny movie showing that when we look at the features for these measured cells, they tend to group by cell, uh, cell cycle phase. So that brings us to the idea of doing morphological profiling, the idea of trying to capture all of these hidden things, things our brains can't even detect, by taking cells, treating them in some way, whether that's gene overexpression, knock down, knock out, treating them with chemicals, doing some combination thereof, um, doing experiments in multi-wall plates. Uh, and when I say multi-wall plates, people tend to think of tens or hundreds, but one plate is fine. Um, we can do this with re relatively small numbers of samples, putting these on some sort of an automated microscope, doing a consistent automated image analysis, and extracting just as many measurements as we can possibly get our hands on. And that creates a morphological profile of the cell in the same way you might see something like this red and blue diagram that, and be thinking of gene expression, where genes are up and down, we can see if certain morphological features are up and down. And in the same way, we can then see how different features interact with one another, if they co-vary, and which ones are, are together in certain subsets of our cells, we can do the exact same thing with morphology measurements. The tool we typically use to do this is called Cell Profiler. Uh, it's been out about 15 years now. Um, Anne Carpenter and Ray Jones were the initial authors. Um, and this is the rest of the team who's worked on it in the years since. This is the major reason I show this slide is to give credit to my teammates for all the fantastic work they've done on it. Uh, at this point, it's cited in more than 1,000 papers a year. And it's used in a lot of pharmaceutical companies, but also just a lot of grad students and other people working at the bench on small problems. Um, and we think that's because it's relatively flexible and usable, and also because it's free and open source. Uh, we did just have a cell profiler release of our cell profiler 4.0 about two weeks ago. So I definitely recommend you check it out. Um, there's some fun things since our last 3.0 release. If you're not at all familiar with cell profiler, let me tell you for just a minute what it is. Essentially what cell profiler is, is an image analysis workflow creation tool. Uh, whether you have one image, 100, 1,000, a million, 10 million, Cell Profiler works in essentially the same way. On the left-hand side, I have what we call a pipeline. And the pipeline is a series of image analysis steps, which we call modules, that are strung together in a predetermined, predefined way. Um, I can do things like object identification. I can scale images or smooth them or do any sort of common image analysis processing, processing task I might want to do. 
add measurements, create overlay images, and then save everything out. And the beautiful thing here is without the scientist in question having to learn to code to create a macro like you might use in something like ImageJ, here everything is done in this interface. So you immediately have a reproducible, reliable image analysis workflow that's applied to every image you load in. If you're working with small numbers of images, you can then run this all on your local machine. We also have uh, modules in Cell Profiler designed to export data for them being run in a cluster. So you can work on a small number of machines on your local machine and then apply it to however many plates of data you have somewhere else with a little more compute power. Uh, so this is the tool that we use for most of these uh, morphology measurements, and we think it's valuable. Um, the main, one of the things that we think is most powerful in Cell Profiler is it does a really good job of feature extraction. It has a lot of different measurement modules that you can use. Um, you can look at things like co-localization, image and object granularity and texture, intensity, things of that nature. Although I do want to stress, this isn't just a Cell Profiler sales pitch. Many of these metrics can be found in lots of tools. But Cell Profiler makes it relatively easy by adding one module, say measure object intensity, then get many measurements of, of that feature at once. And again, some of these features that we measure are things that you might think about when you look at an image. For example, intensity, you might think of, well, I wanna look at an image and see how bright a particular stain is. Um, and with adding a single module in Cell Profiler, you get not just the mean or median intensity, but the integrated intensity, uh, the upper and lower quartiles, max and min, and you can multiplex so that an object identified in one channel can be measured in every other channel that you've loaded. Other features that are sort of common sense and human intuitable are things like size and shape. Uh, you can do things like the area, whether something is more circular or more linear, uh, the diameter across certain axes, orientation, things that a human brain is good at thinking about. But also with the measure object size and shape module, you get some more abstract features that are harder for human brains to comprehend, like Zernike polynomials, which are these high level measurements of shape that show whether in different orders of magnitude that cert how certain things are oriented center to edge or left to right. Um, and they end up getting pretty mathematically complicated, particularly when they go past the ones that I've shown here. But when you add all of these Zernike polynomials together, you can actually get pretty accurate uh, renditions of shape. So this is from one of the original papers that was looking at these polynomials for uh, microscopy image analysis. And you can see the, uh, micro the microscope objects that they were trying to describe with Zernike polynomials on the left and then the actual reconstruction with the polynomials on the right, they're certainly not one-to-one -one representations, but you get a lot of fine detail about shape that are hard, that is much harder to capture in something like a perimeter. Um, and this allows you to, again, uh, generate mathematical features that give you really subtle shape information. We also do things like looking at the intensity distribution. Uh, so not just how bright is an object, but is the intensity more concentrated on the center versus the edge? Is it even within a given radius? So is it more on the left and right? And all of these features combine together to what we think of as a morphological profile. Uh, so this was one of, the, one of the original papers that showed that morphological profiling was actually a, a valid screening tool and could really be used to make predictions. Um, our group worked with a chemical set from AstraZeneca uh, and had some cells stained with a nuclear stain, actin stain, and tubulin stain, and was trying to see if they could group drugs by mechanism of action just by analyzing cells treated with those three very simple stains. What they found was actually pretty remarkable, which is that with nuclear staining alone and not using either of the other two stains, they were actually able to get 67% accuracy of figuring out which drugs all belonged in the same class or not. 67% is pretty good just from looking at one organelle. When you include the other two stains, that gets to 94% accuracy. Um, and even the mistakes it's making, again, are things that make sense because they're linked biological processes. 
Uh, DNA damage and DNA replication, of course, co-occur all of the time. Um, Aurora kinase inhibitors, which can cause issues in mitosis, are, are being confused with DNA damage. But again, these are very linked cellular processes. So the mistakes that it makes at least make sense from a biological standpoint for the most part. Um, there's now an entire pharmaceutical company that's based on this idea of morphological profiling recursion pharmaceuticals, of which my boss is a board member. I have no direct affiliation. Um, and it was uh, perpetuated on this one paper in particular where they had a siRNA that could cause a disease phenotype of cerebral cavernous malformation. And what they wanted to do was test drugs to see it, it for this very striking visual phenotype that's created in cells when treated with this siRNA, can we find drugs that when we treat with siRNA plus drug, make the cells look like cells that have never seen the siRNA at all? And the really exciting thing that this paper did that was a little bit tricky is because this phenotype is visually quite striking, they showed the resulting images from the drug treatments to a set of human biologists to pick what they thought were the drugs that best reverted the phenotype to look like healthy. And they used morphological profiling approaches to do this. And then they fed mice the two different sets of drugs. And it turns out that whatever aspects of the image the human biologists were looking at were actually not as effective at predicting which drugs would actually treat the disease in the mouse as the things that the computer was able to pick up on, perhaps subtle changes in shape or intensity or distribution. Uh, our human brains couldn't actually find the right phenotype, but the computer could. So since knowing that this sort of approach would really work, our lab uh, has gone on to try to develop what we call the cell painting assay. The original version was developed alongside uh, Stuart Schreiber's group. Um, there's a protocols link here at the bottom for a nature protocols paper that's open. Uh, you can read the whole thing. But cell painting was designed to stain as many organelles as possible in the commonly available filter sets on commonly available microscopes using the absolute cheapest drugs we could find or stains we could find. So the, the stains that are actually used here will be familiar to any of you who are wet lab scientists. Things like hooked and mitotracker and wheat germ agglutinin, things you probably already have sitting in your bench freezer anyway. And the idea is simply how can we maximize the number of features we can measure from a single cell? Because if we can maximize the number of features, we can look for more and more subtle differences, even more than we were able to see in the sort of 1.0 version of this with the actin, tubulin, and nucleus stain. And this cell painting assay has come up with some really exciting approaches and some really exciting results. Um, this is work from Mohamed Roban, who a few years ago was a postdoc in the group, now has his own group. And he was looking at gene overexpression of various alleles and whether or not we could actually group those genes into their known pathways simply from looking at cell painting data. And this is the cluster diagram that came out of that cell painting data. There's a lot here, so let me just zoom in on one aspect. And what you can see here is we have a lot of members of the RAF and RAS pathway all nicely grouped together. Next to those, we have a couple of activating mutations of BRAF and RAF. And those are not quite in the same cluster. So it knows that those are similar, but not the same. And so it can detect actually relatively subtle differences. And what Muhammad found is we found a lot of things like this, things that we that made sense and we could understand. And of course, that's always nice to find things that you already know are true. But obviously, we don't want cell painting to just tell us things we already know. We want to ideally be able to use it to discover new connections. So Muhammad and Trontanu looked at the various uh, compound or excuse me, pathway pathway interactions that came out of this study by look by comparing rich clusters look very different from one another or very similar. And most of what they found, again, was already known, but they found at least one, a anti-correlation between the NF-kappa-B pathway and the HIPPO pathway that was previously unreported in the literature. So we, uh, we are a computational group. We found some biologists who could build a reporter assay for us to see whether or not we could actually test that this anti-correlation in terms of phenotype was actually 
uh, showing a difference in gene activity or expression in the actual cells. And obviously I'm telling you the story. So um, when, we, when they built a HIPPO pathway reporter, uh, when you overexpress different NF kappa B pathway members, expression of the reporter goes way down, indicating these genes are actually anti-correlated and that that was something we could tell just from the morphologies looking relatively opposite. So that was super exciting. Um, this is some unpublished work that's currently being led by Marzia Higgy, a postdoc in the group, um, looking at disease states and trying to see if we can do similar things. And this is in patients with different psychiatric disorders. What I think is the most exciting thing about this work is we're looking at cultured patient skin fibroblasts from these, uh, these different patients. We're not actually looking at any sort of brain tissue or tissue that's hard to get. This is just skin. And what we see is that in different psychiatric conditions, there are actually different subgroups of cells plotted here that are over or underrepresented in certain psychiatric conditions. For example, the cluster on the bottom right seems to be largely missing in bipolar disorder, but is there in depressive disorder. Um, so again, this is very exciting work because this is from a tissue type that's relatively easy to get and not even the tissue type that we think is actively causing the disease. Uh, because this is unpublished ongoing work, I can't tell you exactly what are the features that Marzia found that would actually separate certain diseases, but I will show you here that this is a feature. Um, but when we look at cells that are particularly high scores or low scores in that feature, to my eye, I can't really tell the difference, and I've been an image analyst for 15 years now. Uh, so again, this emphasizes the idea that there's more data than we can ever get at just by looking at images, but it's mineable by the computer, and we can let the computer tell us really fascinating stories about our data that we never even thought to look for. Uh, now that this approach has been validated for a few years, our lab, of course, is always looking to tr see how we can push this further. The first thing is, can we capture more of the data? Um, basically, all of the work I've told you about to this point was looking primarily at per well averages and looking at the mean of each, uh, each of the many measurements I talked about for the well, um, as opposed to looking at, say, the standard deviation or some other higher order statistic. Um, and mean or median actually works surprisingly well um, and has done much better than a lot of other fancy approaches that have been proposed by various groups over the years. Um, but what Marzia and Hamda, a post in the group, Hamda Basi, um, found recently is that if they're able to take um, measures of covariance in addition to measures of central tendency like mean or median, adding in covariance gives us information that we might not have um, say comparing the group on the left and the group on the right, which have the same exact standard deviation, but in the treatment on the right, things are either large or small, whereas in the negative control, we have a wider mix. And so using similarity network fusion, when they combine these measures of covariation with measures of central tendency, what they find is that it doesn't make a difference in every single approach, but in some approaches, like in the uh, graph on the far right, uh, using network fusion to combine the, the median, the mat, and the covariant significantly outperforms looking at the median alone. So we're actively investigating ways to try and incorporate more of the data about heterogeneity from, from this into our long-term analyses, because we know that heterogeneity is a hugely important biological, uh, biological property. So all of everything I've said so far has rested on the idea that we are identifying cells or nuclei or other objects in an image and then measuring them. So of course, the, uh, a question that we're very interested in figuring out is, can we do a better job of finding the objects? We do, we think a relatively good job, but we'd like to do even better to make it even more accurate and reduce some of the noise from our measurements. Uh, and one approach that Oh, several groups now have been starting to use and seems to have a lot of promise are using, rather than conventional measures of segmentation like watersheds, using trained units. Um, so this is our trained unit. There are many great ones out there now. Um, and what we trained was nuclei and training specifically the background, the interior, and the boundaries. 
And what we found is that training the boundaries allowed us to really nicely um, find where uh, the nuclei that we're touching, which are very difficult to deal with in conventional circumstances, help us actually split those much more accurately. Uh, so what Juan Caicedo, then a postdoc in this group, and now leading his own group as a fellow at the Broad, you'll hear his name a lot throughout this talk, showed was that um, compared to ba uh, a cell profile or basic pipeline made in only about an hour, or an advanced pipeline that someone spent a few hours making, that approaches like deep cell or our own unit could do a significantly improved job of uh, fixing errors of either nuclei that were missed or nuclei that were incorrectly merged or split. And when we look at the segmentation performance at various levels of strictness, uh, our unit does quite well, much better than the cell profiler pipelines. And as I mentioned, the, the, where we particularly see advantages are uh, in these merges and splits, where something that should be one object is divided into two, or something that should be two objects is into one. When nuclei are touching, which happens a fair amount of the time, conventional methods can really have a difficult time separating those, even though it's screamingly obvious to our eyes. Um, with the way that the units are trained, it can handle this problem much better, and it can perform much, uh, much more accurately. The downside at the time, although this is rapidly becoming less and less the case, is simply the amount of time that has to be spent creating annotations and uh, the amount of CPU running time. If you have access to a GPU, run times for units are pretty fast. Um, the training time is non-trivial, but the hope is that these networks don't have to be trained fresh every time, and that then they can be reused. And so we have incorporated this into a cell profiler plugin, where if you have an image of fluorescently stained nuclei, it will make a three-class prediction where you can then take the nuclear prediction out and identify, excuse me, and separate those into objects uh, in a way that then cell profiler can go downstream and use your measurements. And that was all very exciting. But what we what we really wanted was something that could go one step better. I mentioned that the previous unit will work if you have fluorescent nuclei, but it will only work for fluorescent nuclei of a certain size. And again, fluorescence is by far not the only microscope modality. What we really wanted to know is, can we create something that understands the nucleus in the way a human brain does, that a human brain can look at all five of the pictures at the bottom of the slide here and understand that all of those are nuclei, no matter what color they are, if they're brighter or dimmer than the background, or what size they are. A human brain just gets the idea of a nucleus and finds it no matter what. So a couple of years ago now, we hosted a Kaggle competition that was co-sponsored by Booz Allen Hamilton and NVIDIA to create such a universal nucleus detector. Our lab hand annotated 28,000 nuclei. That took some time, let me tell you. Um, and 4,000 teams competed for over $100,000 in cash and prizes. Um, because we don't want anyone to have to annotate 28,000 nuclei ever again if they can help it, you can now download that data from our website and you can use it to train whatever model you would like. And what we found is that compared to a cell profiler reference that was based on already knowing what the test data was and dividing the test data into categories, some of the top models out, which had never seen the test data before they were trained could actually outperform a cell profiler reference designed specifically for the test data. So what we found was that um, while a cell profiler expert can uh, work perhaps much faster than a cell profiler novice or a un someone who's making units and has to train all their data from scratch um, and, that, and gets a much more accurate result, that if we take the top performing model and apply it to our test data without having to reconfigure it, it significantly outperforms the cell profiler reference in most categories. There's some cells that it just nuclei that it just misses altogether, but overall, it's quite accurate. So this underlies what we hope will be a big change in the image analysis field over the next few years, which is that no one has to think about how to do their segmentation anymore. People have just created good, generally uh, useful models that then can be reused and just find your objects without you having to think about it. 
Uh, at least one paper we know has used data from this challenge in order to actually create a website where you can now upload pictures of nuclei and download uh, the masks that it has predicted. Um, we think approaches like these are really cool. There are now, of course, many approaches starting to use trained deep learning models, such as things like Cellclose and Stardust. And we think that all of these tools are going to become incredibly popular and valuable in the coming years. Um, the software that under, underlay some, one of the winning models in that competition was something that actually came out of our group called Keras RCNN, which is a deep learning framework that's designed to build region-based convolutional neural networks to try and find objects and images. Uh, it, was developed, it was led by Alan Goodman in our group and also worked on by Jane Hung, a grad student in the group at the time. And what Jane was particularly working on was trying to find and stage malaria parasites in blood smear images. Um, and these images were provided by the Marty group. Um, and what Jane was able to do is actually train a very nice uh, predictor in Keras RCNN to go through and find where her objects of interest were, trying to find not only the red blood cells, but the white blood cells, and which may or may not be infected with different uh, parasite stages. And so Jane trained a two-stage model where at first it tried to find just the red blood cells, which are uh, highlighted here in blue, since those are the vast majority of the blood cells. And then in the white blood cells, differentiate them into different parasite stages. Uh, now this is a pretty difficult problem. Human experts have a hard time agreeing uh, on whether a given cell is in a particular stage. But what you can see here is the different colors represent different parasite stages as annotated by a human expert. And the colors tend to be in large blocks, which means that based on the features that Jane found, um, the parasites of the same stage as judged by a human annotator are being found uh, by the group or by the software as well and grouped together. Uh, and she was able to achieve 73% accuracy in identifying those stages. 72% um, was the level of agreement between two human experts. So this was actually pretty much in line with what's already possible. Um, and pot potentially, if this work were extended with more experts who could come to a consensus, could potentially be pushed even further. So this work is out now, um, and the data set is available. Once we found the objects themselves, the next thing we also want to know is, can we extract better features? I spent a few minutes talking to you about what, as a biologist, I think of as a feature and what I was always trained to look at. Things that are obvious, like the intensity or the shape, and even some things that are less intuitive, like the Zernike features. And usually what we do is we take all of those measurements for a given cell, let's say whether its intensity is up or down, its shape is, is A or B, and we just concatenate all those measurements into a profile and do some sort of a statistical analysis. But there's absolutely no reason that those features have to be anything as intuitive as an inten as a intensity or a shape. We know from our segmentation work and from work other people have done with deep learning that deep learning based features can actually be just as valuable for classifying images and for generating features as conventional features such as intensity and shape. So if you've always been wondering what deep learning is the whole time I've been giving this talk and you never were quite uh, able to ask, uh, let me give you the, the two minute introduction to how it actually works. Um, I definitely recommend you go to playground.tensorflow.org to play with a demo that's very like this, although I would set aside an hour or two because it can be very addictive. Uh, and essentially what a deep learning based model is doing is applying different filters over the objects and then it's connecting each filter more or less strongly. Um, this will become more obvious what I mean in a second when I show you the results of training a network. Here it's trying to learn the idea of a spiral based on these initial ideas of features such as orange should be on the left, blue should be on the right, orange should be on the bottom, blue should be on the top, things of that nature. And here it is after trying a thousand times to combine these features in different ways to see if it can learn the shape of a spiral. And you can see after a thousand tries, it's, it's not quite perfect yet. It doesn't really have the underlying idea of a spiral, but it's pretty close to actually fitting. 
And what you may notice if I toggle back and forth is that the connection lines between these different, what we call neurons, which are just filters, are now very different widths. Some of them are very, very wide and some of them are narrow. And that just refers to essentially how good a job a given filter is doing at creating this ultimate shape that we want. So we call the thickness of these lines weights. And a feature can either have a high weight or a low weight depending on if it should be emphasized or penalized in terms of accurately predicting the output result. So what Juan did was tried to see if he could overcome some things that are problems for conventional image analysis, um, like, uh, like batch effects, by using deep learning to do something that on, on the one hand sounds actually kind of stupid. He tried to train each cell to predict what chemical it was treated with. Now I say this sounds kind of stupid because we already know for each cell, we know which well it came out of and therefore what chemical it was treated with. We're trying to get it to learn something that we already know. But what this does is create what's called a weakly supervised network, which says that while we ultimately don't care that the cell is going to give us a prediction of what chemical it's treated with because we already know that answer, we know that it's gonna train a network that learns features about cells that are ultimately valuable if we end up getting good performance on this uh, chemical guessing test. Now we can take these feature layers and the weights between them as measurements and we can stack all those measurements and see which ones predict uh, if certain chemicals are same or different in exactly the same way we can a more intuitive measurements such as a size or a shape. Ultimately, in the end, these are all just numbers in a computer and these deep learning based numbers are just as useful in, predict, uh, in making predictions as the numbers that we were trained to think about as biologists. So what Juan found is that this weekly supervised approach actually works extremely well. And in that analysis I told you about at the beginning, that we were able to get 94% accuracy using classical features, Juan was able to get 97% accuracy and get it 700 times faster. Uh, so this is clearly something where even though the, the features themselves are less intuitive and in a way, as a biologist, you, you wish that you knew which aspects of the image it cared about, the fact that it's much more accurate and much faster is a huge leap. And people are certainly working on how to make these networks more intuitive and help us learn from them what they actually learn more easily. Uh, so Juan, with some interns, has been working on a tool called Deep Profiler that you can check out, which it does these applies these sorts of networks to create features. In just the last few minutes here, I want to talk about the kinds of new experiments we can imagine coming from this. Um, the fact that we can create these sorts of profiles creates really fascinating possibilities for future exploratory work. So one thing that we can do is we can simply compare all of the profiles we've ever accumulated to see if any of them in the same way that Muhammad looked for if certain overexpressions grouped by known pathways or not, we can take gene data and chemical data and compare them to see if, for example, MAP kinase inhibitors look anti-correlated with MAP kinase overexpression. And while this work suffers from some issues with things like aligning batches of data that were taken at different times, potentially on different microscopes, uh, we have some preliminary uh, success here that we think means that this approach is actually going to work very well going forward. And I'll talk to you in a couple slides about some of the ways we're gonna work to try to overcome some of those problems. Uh, I said that our cell painting assay and morphological profiling are, was designed to be done as cheaply as possible with the easiest possible reagents to acquire. And this is a project that has bounced around our lab for a few years, but recently has been put on bioarchive by Greg Way, a great new postdoc in the group, um, looking at uh, cell health, what we call our cell health assay, which is a panel of dyes that are specifically designed to look at cell cycle and cell viability. And comparing those with cell painting assays to see, can we actually train a network that uh, when we look at the same, uh, the same uh, 
chemical applied to cells and then look at either their cell painting outputs or the cell health outputs, can we predict what the cell health assay outputs would have been just from looking at cell painting images? So essentially here, this is a linear regression model for each of the different cell health phenotypes, things like what cell cycle phase is the cell in, um, how viable is it, is it happy, is it unhappy? And so when Greg ran these various models, what he found, and I have, I've cut off the, the text of what each individual thing is simply because it, it makes the figure really busy, but for various categories of kinds of cell phenotypes we might care about, things like death, viability, and cell cycle phase, in some senses, it does a very good job of predicting from cell painting data, which is cheap and easy to get, what the cell health phenotype would have been or is when actually collected um, in, very, in very strongly predictive ways. It doesn't work for every phenotype. You can see that some of these actually have negative predictive value once they're trained, but it means that we can do a cheaper, simpler assay and use it to actually, with, and depending on our phenotype, with some reasonable level of confidence, actually predict a much more difficult, more expensive assay to do. And this isn't just theoretical. Uh, we, in a collaboration we did in the past with Janssen Pharmaceuticals, uh, found a similar thing. In that case, they weren't just even looking at two different kinds of imaging assays, but in fact, comparing imaging assays to really any other assay result. So if you have any assay at all that you do that's difficult to scale because it is expensive or time consuming or requires mice or requires anything that is just difficult to scale, what they found is in at least some cases, if you compare it to image measurements, you can find image measurements that predict the output of your assay. Again, it doesn't work all the time, just like with the sort of image assay to image assay, but it definitely works some of the time. And what Janssen did that I think is extremely cool is they didn't actually run any new imaging assays for this work. They used old imaging assays they just had sitting around that were not even necessarily the best stains for the different kinds of assays they wanted to predict. This is a really general approach. What's exciting is, is then if you have lots of imaging data, say you've run your cell painting assay on a lot of different compounds, once you've trained this classifier, if you have a classifier that works, now you can do some sort of in silico uh, second round hit selection where you can try to say, all right, if this particular shape feature predicts my, the success in my expensive, hard to do assay, let's look at all of the chemicals we've ever looked at that actually generate that shape feature. And in our second round of screening, let's use those let, to see if we can improve our hit rates. And when they were able to successfully train the classifier, what they found is they got vastly improved hit rates. Now that requires having a lot of data. So one thing we're doing right now is just working to create a lot of data. Uh, right now we have a consortium that's underway here that we call Jump Cell Painting. And the idea is to create the world's largest public cell painting data set. Um, so that we can help in the same way that you can download lots and lots of genomes online, you can be able to download lots and lots of morphological profiles. Um, we're working with seven, I think it's now more than that, pharma companies um, and various scientists at some nonprofits as well to create literally hundreds of thousands of compounds of uh, morphological profiling data as well as some uh, changes in gene expression. And those, once we have all of those created, they'll be released to the public after an initial embargo, which means that anyone who has done any sort of cell painting assay following our standard protocols that we've published can compare their favorite gene overexpression or knockdown or their favorite compound to this large reference set. And we think that that will help uh, really make this morphological profiling approach work for anyone, no matter what scale that they're working on. The very last thing I just wanna briefly mention that we're now working to do is to start using this in pulled screens versus arrayed screens. Pulled screens can be very powerful because instead of having to make, if you want to screen 10,000 genes, 10,000 viruses, you can make one giant pool of virus and apply it to your whole plate and then try to figure out essentially which viruses are over or underrepresented. 
Um, this has been known, of course, for a while now, and, and the pooled screens can give you really awesome, fascinating things. Um, you have to be able to relate the process of interest, though, with the enrichment phenotype. And this has been hard to do in some imaging conditions. So working with the Blaney and Neal labs at the Broad, the Blaney lab was able to uh, create a, an in situ barcode sequencing approach that works really nicely in their hands. And so allows you to read out the barcodes of a particular genetic perturbation actually in situ on, the, on a microscope slide so that you can know a particular cell which has a particular morphology has a particular genetic alteration as well. And we're working with them now to create a version of cell painting that works alongside those particular uh, dyes that they use for their in situ sequencing approach so that we can combine the power of morphological profiling with the ability to scale of pooled sequencing. And that's work that's ongoing and is very exciting. If I haven't bored you to tears at this point, what you're hopefully thinking is, how can I learn how to do this stuff and where can I go for help? Uh, uh, a few years ago now, um, our group got together with some other labs and held a hackathon to uh, try to figure out how different groups that work on morphological profiling were doing different aspects of their workflow, such as their image analysis or their quality control and come up with a set of best practice paper, uh, best practices that then they published into a paper. So you can read that paper at Nature Methods. It's a couple years old now, but the general principles are the same. What that hackathon turned into is something called the Cytodata Society, which is a group of labs, again, sort of descended from that original hackathon, that get together every year to do hackathons, challenges, symposia, and other things related to morphological profiling. They have a conference next month um, where things like this will be discussed. Uh, I believe the abstract submission deadline is today. So if you think you want to participate in the symposium there, get your abstracts in today. But it's a really great group of people if you want to learn the approaches that are being done here. If you have questions about image analysis in general, I'll direct you to forum.image.sc, which is the open source scientific community image analysis forum. Uh, it was started by a merger of the ImageJ Forum and the Cell Profiler Forum, but we now have literally dozens of open source image analysis tools that are represented by their, uh, their creators or their maintainers on the forum. Uh, there are things like conference announcements and job opportunities posted, but also you can just upload a picture and say, I have a picture, it looks like this, this is what I want to know, how do I do it? And you have representatives from dozens of uh, open source software tools who will help answer your question and who can help you find the best image analysis methods for your question. And finally, uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, uh, our lab has now created a new initiative along with Kevin Elisari's group at University of Wisconsin-Madison that we call the Center for Open Bioimage Analysis. And our, the idea is to create an open source image analysis community in the U.S that helps create new tools, makes things like those deep learning tools that I mentioned easier for everyone to access, and also do training activities such as seminars and workshops to make it easier for people to learn how to do what's already possible. So you can keep an eye on our website or on our Twitter account. Uh, we also post to that image analysis forum, and we hope to have many hackathons and things in the future where people can get together and participate in image analysis conversations. I'd finally just like to thank the rest of the group. I presented a tremendous amount of work here, um, almost none of which was done by me. It was done by a large group of talented people. Um, our biology collaborators created all of the images I showed. As I said, we're a completely computational group, so everyone else has made the images. Uh, and would like to, of course, thank you guys for your attention and the people who gave the money to support all this work. Thank you very much. OK, thank you so much, Dr. Simony. Um, now, in the time we have left, let's get to our listeners' questions. Um, so, you just um, kind of answered this question, but is there a steep learning curve to learn how to use Cell Profiler, and are there actually online tutorials available? Um, so, we hope there's not too steep of a learning curve. Um, with any piece of software, the balance between power and intuitiveness can be very difficult to manage. Um, on our COBA YouTube page, we actually have a number of 
tutorials on how to get started with Cell Profiler. Um, I apologize, some of them are by me, um, but we have a bunch from different members of the group. Um, and we have a bunch of written tutorials as well if you prefer that to videos. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, could Cell pro Profiler be used for yeast colony classification? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, if you go to our website and you click on our example pipelines, we have one specifically designed for yeast colony uh, red-white classification. And you could use it for any other yeast colony classification you wanted as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And um, could cell, pro sorry, cell profiler also be used um, for imaging flow cytometry? And if so, is there like a, um, a recommended workflow for this? Yeah, so actually if you go to that same example page on our website, um, the the images I showed near the beginning with the different cell cycle phases came from some image flow cytometry work um, that Mindone, a fantastic postdoc in the group who's now moved on to an industry position, did to help create these uh, workflows. So we have some scripts on the example page of our website that will show you how to take the data that comes off the imaging flow cytometer, turn it into a format that Cell Profiler is more comfortable with, and then walks you through how to do measurement and downstream analysis of imaging flow data. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, are there special considerations to take into account for, for cell painting in terms of like fixation times or certain stains that will work better to help avoid background? Great question, great question. Um, so in general, cell painting just kind of works, um, but really um, where particular considerations are gonna come into is in terms of how neatly you can align one batch to another, and also things like edge effects and um, you know whether a well that's in the center of the plate looks like something at the edge of the plate. Um, because cell painting and morphological profiling are exquisitely sensitive, um, we find that they, they can really show things like well effects. And so special care has to be taken in either sort of designing your setup to use things like a, a high humidity incubator so that the cells don't dry out if they're in wells at the edge. Um, and a lot of that is outlined in that in that Nature Methods article. Um, in terms of what stains, um, because this is a sort of generic approach and cell painting is just one way to do it, the nice thing is, is it sort of doesn't matter which stains that you use as long as you're measuring the cells as much as you can. Um, we've definitely seen people who've done uh, versions of cell painting where they dropped out one dye and put in another. We've worked with people who work on adipocytes who dropped out uh, some stains and put in Bidipi. We've worked with groups that dropped out MitoTracker and put it in LysoTracker. Um, there's no harm in sort of tailoring the cell painting assay towards a phenotype you're hoping to get out. Um, but in general, as long as you're collecting lots and lots of measurements, it seems to mostly just work. Okay, wonderful. Thank you again, Dr. Simini. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have for today. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to our speaker directly. Her email address is shown on the screen. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the DDM website and you'll receive an email notifying you when the webinar is available on demand. On behalf of DDN, I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Beth Simony, and our sponsor, PHCBI. And of course, our thanks to you for listening. And goodbye. <laughs>